you almost become like a music monk. Performance becomes less a part of the process and just the, the ritualistic, the way that you live your life is through this practice. And the practice is your relationship with the instrument. This is a Scott Tinkler, a wonderful, well, amazing trumpet player and uh, improviser, now living on an island somewhere. Uh, and, uh, yeah, welcome, and thanks for agreeing to this. Thank you very much, mate. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll just I'd like get... to be wonderful as well. Be the what, sorry? I'd like to be wonderful as well. You said, well, not wonderful, but it's amazing. But oh, wonderful. okay, well, yeah. <laughs> we can be, yeah, wonderfully amazing. How about that? Oh, how's that? Thank you very much. Well, awesome. I'll put it on my resume. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. I'll, I'll uh, send, it, send you an email. Um, right. Yeah, so the first, the first question is uh, why do you have music in your life? Uh, yes, and I've been thinking about this question ever since you sent me the three questions. Um, I reckon that I really enjoy the way music makes me think. And it really, I, I like the way it makes me address situations in my life, uh, my thought process, it help, uh, the way that it um, helps me address emotional issues, uh, issues of ego, all of those sort of, I guess, philosophical questions, that I would say, is why music is in my life now or remains in my life now and is such a big part of it as opposed to um, why it's in my life, how it started to be in my life. But definitely um, the reason it's in my life now is, uh, and it continues to be in my life, is I really like the way it makes me address life. Um, earlier give, this, oh, wow. Sorry. I was going to say, could you, yeah, sort of give me an example of how, how you sort of, um, how thinking about music filters into into your life? Um, oh, look, it's, it's very difficult to pinpoint exact things. I, I, I like the, I, um, oh, let's go physically. But physically, for example, I like, I like the process of each day having to get up and address the instrument. I like, it, uh, it makes me think about my physicality. It makes me think about breathing. It makes me think about, uh, a relationship I have with this inanimate object, but it's sort of, um, to me, it's sort of like um, a yoga approach, I guess. And not that it's like yoga, but I mean, in, in the in the similar way that someone does yoga to wake their body up and think about their day and to meditate, or that someone might get up and read scripture or whatever they're into, or whatever. For me, um, getting up early uh, and picking up the instrument and putting air through it and thinking about vibration and sound and stuff, that's that's the thing that makes me physically feel good and it sort of centres me. Mm. And then, um, many times in my life I think that um, my relationship with the trumpet and that physicality has actually saved me from going <laughs> south in the <laughs> physical right. stakes, you know, through various <laughs> abuse situations in my life, yep. times in my life. It sort of brought me back and kept me a little bit, well, not sane. I won't say sane, but yeah, yeah. Let's not go there. Let's not go that far. No, let's not go there. Yeah. Um, so I really, I, I like that. Uh, I like the repetition of that. The the daily sort of ritual of addressing this instrument and waking up my lungs and getting clearing the mind and just focusing it, it on sound. I think that that helps me. It helps me remove a lot of the the clutter that is that we put in there every day. Like we were just talking about the obsession with short video clips of, on YouTube or Instagram yeah. or things like that. And then all that mind deadening stuff that we can't help but start to be addicted to. And it's also part of in the music. It's also part of our scene. It's the way we relate to other people, or well, not relate, but the way we keep in contact with other people. Like people may be watching this on YouTube. Mm, yeah, yeah, you know. It's difficult, but your head does get full of all this sort of shit, you know, and, mm. and it's, uh, I find for me that um, the music or the, the relationship with my instrument anyway is 
it's a process of meditation or gathering my thoughts, finding my comfortable spot, my home ground, mm. so to be, you know, and um, it, it just it sort of keeps me sort of centred in a way. Um, mm. I've talked to um, Simon Barker a fair bit about this lately, and he's into, he talks a lot to Bill Slater about it or Carl Dewhurst about the idea that um, <clears throat> you almost become like a music monk because it's like, we, n none of us do many gigs, if if at all. You know, I mean, in, in the time of COVID, you know, people hardly play live at all. But previous to that, for years, I haven't actually performed that much. You know, and a, performance becomes less a part of the process, um, and just the the ritualistic the way that you live your life is through this practice, and the practice is your relationship with the instrument and. And, and it's a really interesting thing. You become like a, a monk, like this Buddhist monk. That's it's not the same as because we're not Buddhists. Yeah, but yeah. You're, you know that ritualistic mm -hmm. approach to a to um, a commitment of a relationship with an instrument and that development of sound and that that everyday search that you're trying to slowly develop over years and years of, a, of this relationship. And um, it's obsessive, but it's sort of also calming in another way yeah. mm. and that's i mean <clears throat> i i had to address that last year because um because we moved down here and um i did this big renovation on the house and i knew it was going to be at least six months of pretty much full-time work so I, I agreed with myself to put the trumpet in the case and forget about it and i actually thought you know maybe i just won't play again maybe it's time to stop playing you know maybe you know, just do something else, you know. Mm. Um, but as soon as the build was sort of started to quieten down, um, I, I and I got asked to do this particular performance um, celebrating the music of John Rogers, and I thought, oh, after about four months off, I've got a month to get ready for this gig. Um, you know, maybe I'll pick up the horn, you know, and start getting into it. And it was just the, the first note that I played on the instrument, it was just like, oh, Wow. Is, that's right. I've got this whole sort of life of commitment and sort of exploration flooded back to me, and the feeling was so good. Not that I felt shit before, really, because I was working so hard in the house, I was distracted. Mm. But um, just that feel, and it was just so lovely. I just thought, oh, I don't care if I never do a gig again. I, mm. I want to play, and I want to have a relationship with the instrument because it's just so. It feels like the way I want to live my life. It's just mm. the way my life should be, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I don't yeah, think that. Like, oh, oh, yeah, because I think I think a lot of people do. You know, their, you know, of course, everyone's different, but their their attachment to music is, yeah, sort of the outcome or the performance of it. You know, getting getting music performed or doing performances—that's sort of what people strive for. But yeah, it's um, I think there's probably less people who it's it's about about the process. Mm, that's yeah, really interesting. Well, yeah. I mean, I've definitely been there before. I spent, I've done a lot of albums, you know, and I've done a, a lot of performances over mm. the years. But um, in a way, you, the further you get through that, the more you realise that you know, a lot of those albums, people, have just, you know, no one cares that much. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. they care at the time. Or you care at the time. Mm. It's a, it's, but it's only a small part of a long process. Or that gig you did in. 1998 to this many people or whatever, you know, it really, it doesn't really matter, you know. Mm. Uh, what, what matters is the, you start to realise, or I start to realise for me, is the continual process of development and growth. And it's, it's um, and I, I think that can, uh, music can tie into that um, on a, on an emotional and personal level, you know. Mm. Um, do you, do you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, do you sort of consider, I guess, you know, recordings and, I guess, well, I guess performances as well as sort of a way of, um, well, yeah, do I, do you, do you have a way to sort of measure? Because, you know, I mean, I guess in the modern world, you know, you always need to measure outcomes and do you, do you consider that as <laughs> part of your process or is it just? I wouldn't say measure, I would say document for sure. Yeah, document, yeah. Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes it's good to just to 
document something in order to move on to the next thing. Otherwise, you can get stuck in an area. Mm. And for sure, with music, documentation is about is recording or like the performance of a particular project, you know, that really works, work, you know, with a lot of work to get to or something. Mm. Um, and and that, that's important. You, ne you need those moments of resolving an issue, you know, and going, okay, right. So that's where that got to. Now I, I now I do need to move on and see what else is going on. Mm. Um, and that's one reason I've tried to set up um, home recording. Everyone's got recording view at home now, which is sort of a fantastic thing because it does mean that we can, if we can uh, document our own progress, uh, you know, or document moments of that without having to spend thousands of dollars to go into a studio and, you know, it, it can be a really positive thing for you to document something, listen to it and go, okay, that's that That was that, I've got that done, now I can mm. move on, you know. Yeah, and yeah, at, at your own pace as well. You don't sort of have to plan months ahead or and you can just do it exactly. at, in your own time, Take as your own pleasure, yeah. When you feel good, that's one thing about often the recording process, you know, going into the studio, you have to be good on that day. You have to plan to feel good on that day. Then yeah. you get there and you spend three hours setting up and then you're you playing and you're getting the sound. By the time you go to do the first take, you're going, oh, my chops, I'm tired now. And I mean, if my head's all messed up. I'm thinking about this and thinking about this, you know. Mm. And, um, and that can, it can be really, really challenging. Yeah. Know? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and also just being comfortable with the room as well. You can sort of uh, knowing the room really well. Yeah, knowing yeah, knowing how it yeah. sounds, how it feels, the best spots in the room. Yeah, that's also yeah. another important spot. Um, yeah, totally. The second question is: How do you make yeah. music? Uh, with great struggle, <laughs> I reckon. Um, how how do I make music? I can, I'm sort of confused about this question in a way. I Good. make it with my trumpets. <laughs> yeah. I um I w work on the work on ideas that I think are the building blocks of um music as I as I like. I like notes and rhythm. They're, they're the things that I really like. I, I like notes and rhythm, and so I work. I practice a lot thinking about those things stemming from um, the mentors I've had um, and the uh, apprenticeships I've done in various mm. bands or one particular band. And uh, <clears throat> so but that that is very much challenged often by the people I play with. And so um, I try to make music with an open mind, <laughs> that could, you know, to, towards it accepting influence from other people, you know. Um, and what, why, why, yeah. why just notes and rhythm? Um, I, I, I find the intellectual challenge and relationship of them to be very interesting. I like the way that, they, that that works for me. It works for me as a player. That doesn't mean that I don't love people who just work from um, a, a, a sound point of view. Um, or, or an environmental sort of thing that I can still relate to that and play with them. But my thing, I, I like to mainly focus on notes and rhythm. And that's, well, um, that's the way I like to exist, I think. It also helps me, um, I, th I think there's, there's a lot that goes through your mind when you play, and part of it is belief and justification. You need some sort of, um, uh, belief system to play your music. You can't. You mm. can't just go well, blah blah blah. You know, you need to. You need to have some sort of belief of why you think that sounds good. What What is it mm. that you think that you've done that sounds good? Is it um, just like the the sound that you're producing, or is it the relationship of space and time, and then harmonic thing uh, intervals? You know, when I say notes, it's you know, harmony, intervals, you know, mm. but, um, that there's a justification there in, a, in your belief system that makes you express yourself a certain way. If you don't have this belief, then I don't think you can't play with an, this sort of intent that I think you need to play with that music has. 
Mm. Yeah, or the, the, the music that I like has, having that sort of in, real intent, you know. Mm. Um, and, and, I mean, that's what I look for when I listen to people play or when I go to play with someone is them sharing with me their belief in what music is, you know. I mean, mu- what, I mean what really is music, you get down to the John Rose question, of, you know, mm. what is music? And a lot of the time, I mean, I, I just don't know. I mean, it's totally <laughs> subjective. It's just a, mm. an, a, 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 a music's in the ears of the beholder. So there's a lot of music in the world and a lot of variety. But, um, yeah, mm. and, and having some sort of intent and belief system, I think, is important. I've even forgotten what the question was now. Yeah, no, well, th- I mean, that makes uh, a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, I mean, you're when, when you know, or when I hear you play, you know, there's definitely intention. There's just there's so much commitment to what what it is you want to say. And yeah, and the reason I asked about why just notes and rhythm because I think I mean you have a, I mean your sound is very identifiable, and I guess the sounds of the notes and the rhythm that you play is really identifiable. So I wondered if you do consider. Um, yeah, sort of sound or timbre as as sort of as part of your process. Well, well, totally. But um, I, I think I've just. I mean, that's the thing I work on. The first thing I work on every day is sound, and and delivery of that. You, uh, I guess I should have included that. But, um, I just take that for a, a given, really. <laughs> right? Is that uh, is it just a brass, a brass thing? Uh, I don't. I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, you just can't. Can you make music without sound? John Cage would say maybe so. Mm. But even then, the whole idea of silence is that you then address the other sounds that are there that, mm. that you may not hear. So, so sound is obviously um, going to be an, an initial factor that you work on for sure. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but that's delivery. Notes and rhythm are pretty shit house if they're just da 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 You know, it's like it's the sound and delivery of those notes mm. is what brings them to life. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm. And um, but the the other aspect to that question, how do I make music? Is I would say mainly improvise. Now, like I'm. I haven't written any music for a very long time. I'm very into the idea of improvisation. I sort of, I mean, I wrote a lot of music when I was younger, play in my like my albums, all original music. Um, but the, I sort of began to realise that the people that I play with come up with a lot better ideas to play than anything I can play, <laughs> or anything I can write. Yeah. yeah. So if I'm even when I remember when I had Drub together, I, I had this band called Drub, mm. and um, it was I had a trio. Simon um, Barker was in it at the time, but Adam Armstrong had left overseas, and so I, um, I got a new band called a Drub, and I got Brett Hurst to play bass, but I and I got Carl Dewhurst to play guitar, and I wrote a bunch of these tunes, and um, I told I showed them to Brett and Simon, but. Um, Carl was like, oh, so what are we going to play? And I said, well, I'm not going to tell you. you know, and he goes, well, what? Why not? And I'm like, you don't need to know. And so we just, I just started playing the tunes with Brett and Simon and Carl just did his thing. And, of course, Carl's got such amazing ears anyway. He, he didn't take long before he picked him up and sort of knew what was sort of going on and play around and stuff. But the idea of me writing these because it was it's a fairly thrashy band you know but the idea of me telling carl what to play with because i know nothing about electronics and yeah you know extended guitar and other stuff but just like just let him fucking do it you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. you know? yeah and he and it was amazing. it's like he and it's just it, yeah it, i realized more and more after that that i rather i like improvising with people i like mm-hmm. i like that challenge i like the the struggle the the weirdness, the the fact that it can be really uncomfortable, and mm. in order to get away from that discomfort, you've got to work really hard to find an area that gets comfortable, and then discomfort comes back again, and it's really good. Rather than 
rather than falling back on, okay, I've got this tune that I can fall back on. I can't just yeah. play the head and then do the solo, which is all fine. But I just found for me personally that in order to get that next level of intent and intensity and sort of exploration in the music, I just wanted to improvise, you know. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. So improvisation is a massive thing for me. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, the third question is. Uh, okay, we can. Yeah. Pretty quick. Oh, we're we're on a roll. <laughs> um. <laughs> uh, uh. What excites you musically right now? Right. Well, when you first sent me the questions, I was thinking about that, and I thought, well, there is many layers to this because mm. I do, I do listen to a lot of music still. Um. There's the international level, you know, like the New York scene. Um, I was in New York early this year, February, and, you know, seeing players like Matt Mitchell, um, Chris Davis, you know, Tony Malaby, um, a, whole, a whole entourage of players that just fantastic players, lots of really interesting music. Um, and, and that scene, I do find that scene quite interesting and, and exciting still. Mm. Even though it's um, music that I, I may not play, you know, particularly like, you know, but um, the, yeah, that that scene. Um, um, Anna Weber put out an album last year, I think it was Clockwise. That is an amazing album, and that really got me going. I mean, there's a heap of albums I've listened to lately that were fantastic. So there's that international scene, which um, or overseas scene, I should say. Um, mm. That, that there's a lot of plays that are, are really, you know, that I really enjoy. Ingrid Lowbrook, she's playing fantastic. I saw her, I played with her when I was there um, in February. And just, it's, it's a, there is a lot of healthy um, energy in that scene. It's really good. Mm. Uh, then there's the, the local sort of scene that has just, is, is fantastic, you know. Um, I've been listening to Andrea's new album, Life is Brutiful. Yes. Um, and, you know, so many of my favourite players on there, you know, that I just love to death. Mm. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I try to listen to everything Scott McConaughey, every note that he'll ever play, I would gladly listen to a thousand times. Um, Dark Patton, Phil Slater, um, he put out... I think it was late last year or early this year, Dark Patton and man, Phil Slater with that, that little that group of people, Phil mm. Slater, Matt McMahon, um, Brett Hurst, Simon Barker. You know, there's a whole crew of that uh, of that Sydney scene, and they're heavily, well, I won't say heavily influenced, but they're influenced uh, by a whole range of things. Like um, Slater's influenced by Skull Talk, for example, as a composer, but. I reckon you can hear the influence of the Necks, who are you know, mm. just fantastic Australian, you know, band. Um, but Phil Slater's album, The Dark Pattern, it's just, it's different and it's beautiful and it's intense and it's dark and it's mm. amazing, very exciting, very, you know, and I mean, there's many players on the, the scene that I love, love checking out still, you know, Paul Williamson, Eugene Ball, Mm. Um, I, I, I dig the scene. It's exciting, you know. A yeah. lot, lot of healthy players around. Um, but since you sent me that question, um, my mentor and the hero, Mark Simmons, died last week. Mm, yeah, yeah. And I'm um, sorry to hear about that. And so, yeah, it's, um, and so I've been uh, I've been chatting with Will Guthrie, and Will sent me a whole heap of other music that bootlegs from Mark's recordings and stuff. I already had a lot. But I've been checking out that again, and I mean, fuck, it's incredible music from the eighties, mm. you know, mainly from the eighties. Um, Bill Trelaw, Feeling to Thought, uh, the Australian Art Ensemble, I think it was called then. With, um, I think Bill Trelaw was in that as well. But that whole period of music, just some phenomenal playing, like um, David Addis, you know, mm. like that Bobby Gebbett. Just that scene is. Like incredible that Simmons, his 
entire concept, it's so strong. And it just in this last week, it's just been kicking my ass again, just exciting me, just making me think, oh my God, I've got, mm. to, I've got to step it up. You know? I've got yeah, to- and there's not, there's not a lot sort of out there about him or uh, that, you know, a lot of people can access. Um, it's a, it's, no, a, it's a shame and I, it should be, I don't know if there's a way to, to get more people aware of him. Well, if anyone wants, they can email me at stinkle at gmail.com and I'll, I'll okay. send them a heap of music yeah. mm. free of my comments that I think people should be listening to. Um, it's a real focus and heritage of Australian music. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. I'd hate to see um, certain other musicians seen as the history of Australian music when this whole intense period and, and with generating such incredible art of a high level. Like, mm. to, to me, Mark Simmons is on the level of Coltrane, on the level of Sonny Rollins. He's on, he's on the level of the upper echelon of anyone that's made music. Mm. They're absolutely phenomenal. Um, yeah, the wow. integrity, the depth of sound, the, the rhythmic control, the hum- his entire concept and also the fact that that concept um, was relatable and teachable in very intellectual ways but then also he did have this other level that was just sort of surreal like he, i mean he could explain rhythmically everything harmonically everything his articulation why he's playing this tune and doing these things on this tune and this and that but then above all of that there's this emotional content and this gut-wrenching feeling in his sound that you just sort of go oh wait a tick, that, that's that's beyond. He's got that that as well, which is beyond mm. any thought process, um, or you know, like directly teachable sort sort of thought process. It's this oh, other wow. thing there, and I'm not into. Um, uh, I'm I'm not a very I'm not a hippie sort of you know sort of guy. <laughs> you know. But 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 that it, there is intent in music that is. It's all, it's like another world. Worldly experience that yeah. you know, when you when you hear it, it's, you just can't explain it. Yeah, well, yeah. well, I'll, so I'll, the, I'll hit you yeah. up for those recordings because yeah, I mean the only the only Absolutely. the only things I've yeah, I mean I only became aware of him that because he was on that that Beyond El Rocco documentary and I was like, oh, who is this yeah. guy that everyone was yeah. talking about? And then seeing some people right. kind of in the I guess talking about him in the late nineties when I used to you know, go to the Wangaratta Festival a lot, living in Victoria. Yeah, yeah. Sort of, you know, you'd hear his name, well, but I, I never heard him play. Right. Well, there's a snippet of um, Feeling to Thought, which is the Phil Law project with Steve Elphick and Dave Addis, and there's a snippet of that on Beyond El Rocco. Yeah. But on the recordings I've got, there's, like, um, full works of that. Right. For like, 30, 35, couple of them over half an hour long. And then with with a string ensemble as well. Oh wow! Um, and yeah, Simmons and Abbas, they, they all just play incredibly phenomenal music. Like mm. just yeah, so brilliant. I sort of wish it was. Well, uh, we wish it was more uh, readily available, and hopefully, it should be taught in the you know in the unis as well as part mm. of Australian history. You know. Yeah, awesome. So Thank this, you. This is awesome. Yeah, cheers. Yep. Cheers. Thank you very much for. Chatting to me, Mace. Yeah, no, thanks for thanks for all the uh, all the words. No worries, and I'll send you the music. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome.